This is Duke University. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to uh, thank you for coming uh, this noon time to hear Professor Guerrero. I'm Charlie Dunlap from the Center of Law, Ethics, and National Security, but this presentation is being sponsored by Professor Helper's Center for International and Comparative Law. And I, it's part of a continuing series, I think, of his center and our center. We're trying to provide lots of different points of view to improve the quality and breadth of education that you get here at Duke University. And this is a very special opportunity for us because Professor Guerra, Amos, is, Amos, you need to get an easier name to pronounce, last Amos. name. Uh, <laughs> I've known Amos for many years. Uh, Amos spent 19 years in the Israeli Defense Force, including various positions, command positions, line positions, as we call it in the military, but also as the commandant of the military law school. And I think that that's when we first began our association those many years ago. However, he's now at the University of Utah, the law school out there, and if you've had a chance to take a look at his online bio, it is really impressive. Not only has he taught a number of courses and, uh, and published, and I'll talk about his publications in just a moment, but he recently won a, a prize from, an award from the American Bar Association for his very innovative teaching style, the scenario-based webcast uh, process of teaching counterterrorism law and, and international law of armed conflict. I think it, it wrapped all of those issues together in the scenario. Very, very interesting, cutting-edge way of teaching, and we're all uh, looking at that trying to, to emulate the lead that Amos has set. <clears throat> but when you look at his academic work, it is also very, very impressive. Uh, it's numerous articles on a wide variety of subjects. In fact, I'm going to look at my notes here. He, um, he's written and lectured on uh, national security, the limits of interrogation, religion and terrorism, uh, the limits of uh, presidential power, multiculturalism, and human rights. A very large portfolio I, I can, I'm sure you can all appreciate. And he's not just spoken on those, he has a, a variety of articles and we're going to hear about some of his new writing that's coming out this afternoon. He's going to be talking on targeted killings. Now I, I will tell you that I don't always 100% agree with everything Amos has to say. But I will tell you, he will make it a thought, he will give you things to think about and maybe a perspective that you hadn't considered before. And we're certainly very pleased that you made time in your schedule to come out here to speak to us and to share your ideas with the students. Without further ado, Professor, thank you very much. After that intro, can you hear me? Does this work? Okay. So, Charlie, thank you for that gracious introduction. It's indeed a pleasure to be at one of America's great law schools talking about one of these fun, easy topics called targeted killing. <laughs> so by way of, of background, just to add to that gracious introduction, for three years from 1994 to 1997, I served as a legal advisor to the Gaza Strip. In that capacity, I was involved in targeted killing decisions. Translated, when the commander was faced with the option, yes or no, to conduct a, a targeted killing, the one who would receive those god awful phone calls at 3 o'clock in the morning was me. And so when I retired from the idea, and Charlie's right, we've known each other for years, I thought to myself, what do I do with, this, with these various experiences that I've had over the course of the 19 years? And what is one perhaps modest contribution that I can make in joining academia? I also obviously need to add that not only have I known Charlie for years, but I've known Scott Silman for many years. And so it really is a, truly a pleasure to be here in your um, distinguished company. And Larry, thank you for um, including me and inviting me. So when we ask ourselves about target killing, here are some food for thought, especially as you all are eating. One, what's the point of a target killing? Two, why conduct it? 
Three, what are you seeking to do? Four, how do you define effectiveness? And five, what's the overarching policy? And six, are there alternatives? <coughs> but background is important. In the mid-90s, in response to increasing Palestinian terrorism, and in particular suicide bombings, the government was posed with the following challenge. How do we minimize the impact and the import of suicide bombings? And various mechanisms were, were tried, some more successful, some less successful. And at the end of the day, it was decided in particular by then Prime Minister Rabin, who really began it, and subsequently others, uh, particularly Sharon, that targeted killing is effective in the following over the following reason. One, it enables you to identify the individual slash individuals who are most responsible for the terrorist infrastructure. And two, it enables you to indicate to the terrorist organizations that you have successfully penetrated them. And three, if a targeted killing is conducted successfully, it enormously minimizes collateral damage. That said, there's no doubt that the policy has been the subject of great criticism, both in, in, uh, obviously internationally, but also in Israel and here in the United States, though we also need to open parentheses and say that targeted killing, or what the United States calls drone policy, has become a part and parcel of American operational counterterrorism. If you look at the numbers and you track the numbers, the Obama administration uses this far more frequently than the Bush administration. I need to add parentheses within parentheses that the Obama administration has come up with an interesting statement that it, under its, uh, in the past three years, there's been no collateral damage when the US has conducted operational, sorry, when it's conducted drone policy. And all of you as young law students need to ask yourselves, how is it possible not to have collateral damage when you conduct drone policy? The answer is, of course, there's collateral damage unless, and here's the critical unless. So you do what the Obama administration does. It says even those standing around in the milieu of the terrorists are guilty by association, which I find to be um, both morally and legally reprehensible. So now let's ask ourselves, how do we go about conducting this and what are we seeking to do? So when I would get the phone call, you know, the famous three o'clock phone call by the, from the commander telling me that he had in his sights a particular individual who posed, and here's the magical phrase, a clear, direct, and imminent threat to state security. And the question was, was he therefore a legitimate target? So now we have to start working our way back because that's the question. Is he indeed a legitimate target? And is he indeed, if you will, and I hate the expression, I apologize, is he killable in the context of target killing? So one important question to ask ourselves is how does the commander know what the commander knows? And the easy answer is the intelligence community provided him with information saying that somebody, you know, um, going here, going there, wearing such and such clothing, is, based on the intelligence community's analysis of intelligence information, poses a threat. But here's the good news and here's the bad news. And the way, best way I can explain this to you is by bringing to life here in lovely Durham a specific example that I'm willing to discuss while I'm fudging the facts, obviously, a little bit. Story goes like this. Three o'clock in the morning, I'm sound asleep. Phone rings. It's the commander. The commander says to me in Hebrew, were you sleeping? Anybody who's ever served in the military knows that when the commander asks you, were you sleeping, the correct answer is no. I was waiting for the phone call. Exactly. <laughs> And the deal I had worked out with my wife that if I, ever, if I ever get one of these damn phone calls is that we play no news, good news, so I go from our upstairs down to our downstairs so she doesn't have to hear the conversation. And the commander tells me the following, that he had received just now a call from the intelligence community telling him that somebody, quote unquote, wearing, and I'm directly quoting, wearing blue jeans and blue pants in his zone of theater, carrying a bag in his right hand, poses an extraordinary danger to state security because of what he carries in his bag, and he would, he's been asked by the intelligence committee to you know, do this target killing. The way it works in the IDF, and I, um, Professor Solomon and Dunlap can add much more about the American um, paradigm. In, in the IDF, <coughs> commander can't do one of these without getting you know, advice from his legal advisor, which is what I was. Now, that doesn't mean that he has to follow my advice. But those of us who have been in the business know the ropes and how the game works, that if I say no, the guy is not killed. And if I say yes, the guy is killed. Even though I'm not the one opening fire and I'm also not the one there. So obviously that raises a whole different discussion about the role of the legal advisor, which is a fascinating conversation to have. I had worked out in my mind, for lack of a better term, a checklist. Because I was firmly of the opinion that in order to authorize these things, one had to have a criteria-based approach. 
Because if you don't have a criteria-based approach, what you're really doing is putting your finger in the air, you know, which way is the wind blowing, it's catch can as you can. Because we're not, you know, talking here about things that are really important like Duke, North Carolina basketball. We're talking here about the possibility of actually killing somebody. It has to be predicated and driven by criteria and particularly by a checklist. So what were the questions I had worked out in advance? What did I ask the commander? One, I asked the commander, where are you? Because I wanted to know if he was home like me. Two, I wanted to know if he was in his office. Or three, I wanted to know if he was there. And if he was there, I wanted to know was he was the one who was going to open fire. Two, I wanted to know whether his unit had had disciplinary issues. Those of you who have served in the military know that a unit that has disciplinary issues, the commander is spending way too much time disciplinary, disciplining an insignificant amount of time training. Three, I wanted to know when was the last time the unit had engaged in a nighttime ambush. Those of you who have ever fired a gun know that firing a gun at night is way different than firing a gun at day. It's just two totally different things. Four, I wanted his feel in terms of what, you know, what's he seeing. And the only humorous moment in this entire conversation, which take my word for it, there's no humor in it. So when I asked him about the blue jeans, blue pants, so those of you who have ever looked at nighttime vision know, of course, everything is green. So the only funny conversation, the only part of the funny part of the conversation was, was I said, you know, how green is blue. I mean, that was, on the other hand, humor, humor. On the other hand, that's an important part of this conversation because while he's telling me it's blue jeans, it's actually green, and so what does that mean? Next, I wanted to know, tell me about the, the impending collateral damage. Collateral damage, of course, is, is a fancy schmancy term for the killing of, of innocent individuals. And I wanted to know, was he certain that there were no um, innocent civilians who potentially would be harmed by this? And his response was yes, that he had you know, taken all reasonable efforts to ascertain, determine, and ensure that innocent people would not be killed. Next, I asked him about alternatives. Bless you. I asked him about alternatives. I said, why not go arrest the guy? And he very quickly explained to me that if the intelligence report was correct as to what was in the bag, and I obviously don't want to get into a discussion what was in the bag, but if what was in the bag was indeed in the bag, then I accepted his analysis that that would unduly endanger his soldiers, and I saw no reason to unduly endanger his soldiers given what was in the bag. Next, I asked him, how much time do we have for this conversation? I mean, how, you know, how quickly is the guy walking? And the answer was somewhere, you know, pick your poison, somewhere between two to three minutes, given how quickly he was walking and, and where the, he was and where, the, where the, there were the, down the road innocent individuals. Next, I wanted to know from him, did this individual, in terms of how he was carrying himself, whatever that means, the way that he was, you know, walking through that night, what did it tell the commander based on his pretty significant operational experience? Did he strike the commander as somebody who indeed posed a threat? And seven, I wanted to know with who he had spoken in the intelligence community. And here's where this gets complicated. Those of you who have worked in, with intelligence or in the intelligence community know that the intelligence community speaks a language different than anything all of us speak. A language onto it. <coughs> so here's how it works. The source calls his case officer. But the source calls the case officer in Arabic and doesn't speak regular Arabic, he speaks source Arabic. <coughs> the case officer translates Arabic and source Arabic into Hebrew for the commander, who then calls me and speaks to me in Hebrew. Note we have three distinct languages at play here. We have Hebrew, we have Arabic, and we have source Arabic. We also have four distinct actors. We have the source, we have the case officer, we have the officer, the commander, and we have me. I assume many of you by now have taken crim law, crim pro. I mean, I can't count how many hearsays that is. And you now have to circle all the way back, right? From me back to the source. Because what I'm asking the commander, and unfortunately he really doesn't have compelling answers, is obviously, how, bless you, how reliable is the source? How credible is the source? How valid is the information, is it? And perhaps most importantly of all, how time relevant is it? Time relevant translates into, when did the source provide the case officer this information? Did he provide it five minutes ago, five days ago, five weeks ago, five months ago? The commander, like me, doesn't speak with the source, which means that the single most important person in this entire conversation is the case officer. He is, not to play in the basketball paradigm, he's the pivot. 
He is the linchpin to this entire conversation. He's the only one the source speaks with this way, and he's the only one the commander has spoken with, and I certainly didn't speak with him, which means I'm totally dependent on the following. I'm totally dependent on what the commander understood from the case officer, and I'm totally dependent on the case officer's interpretation, or fancy word, analysis of what the source had told him. Full stop. Now, let's work our way back to the source. Those of you who have ever worked with sources or watched TV shows like what is called um, Law and Order, CSI, and all those others, right? All of us know that sources have agendas, or that many sources have agendas. And one of the most important aspects of this entire conversation was trying to determine whether or not the source was agenda free or had some kind of a, if you, I don't like the expression, a grudge with respect to the particular target. The problem, of course, is that the commander, his ability to concretely, concisely, and accurately answer these questions is extremely limited. All right, now let's ask ourselves about the commander. Who's the commander? In real life, this, command, this particular commander is somebody who I had a a cordial working relationship. Were we friends? No. Was there mutual respect? I think so. I was, was totally dependent on him. I needed him to be an accurate conveyor of information, full stop. But now let's ask ourselves about what's the significance of 3 o'clock in the morning? Three o'clock in the morning is not exactly 12.30 in the afternoon. People are tired at three in the morning. And take my word on this, I don't know how many of you function at three o'clock in the morning, if how many of you are up at three, how well you function. I know you're probably studying for exams, but how well do you really function at three in the o'clock in the morning? How well do you really listen? How carefully do you listen? Are you really locked in at three in the morning? Those are the kinds of subjective questions which I think are absolutely essential to this entire conversation. Full stop, full speed ahead, and then we'll circle back. When we began implementing the policy of targeted killing, we were well aware of the fact that there would be significant criticism in the international community for the following reasons. One, for lack of a better term, the state is playing the role of judge, jury, and executioner. Because we're not detaining him. We are giving each other a go order. He does not have the right to contest that go order. He is not represented by consul. And he does not have the right to appeal. That's criticism number one. Criticism number two is the whole collateral damage question. And that's why, as I said earlier, I find the Obama administration's take on this just to be, as I said earlier, I can only quote myself, morally and legally objectionable. Because innocent people die in these things. Three, the requirement, we knew we'd be criticized on this, the requirement to make true more than due diligence to find and seek and implement alternatives. And I cannot emphasize enough to you the validity of the alternative discussion, because I don't mean to make light of this, but to detain somebody is much more effective than to kill him. Why? Because if you detain somebody, you can interrogate him. If you kill somebody, it's tough to interrogate. So the alternatives discussion is absolutely essential to this. And perhaps most importantly of all, this entire paradigm raises profoundly important legal questions and moral questions about the limits of self-defense. I cannot emphasize strongly enough this issue of self-defense, and we all need to ask ourselves, what are the limits of self-defense from the perspective of international law, from the perspective of comparative law, from the perspective of criminal law, and also from the perspective of morality. This is today in American academia, this is no secrets here, this is a burning question that I don't know how well and fully it's being addressed. It's something that is well worth looking at, and let me give you some what I find problematic paradigms. So I was at a conference um, where we were discussing target killings, and one of the panelists is somebody who very much objects to the whole idea of self of target killings. And we had a discussion about self-defense. Now, I, I posed the question, if we know the individual is about to walk into a coffee house or the pizza parlor, when is he a legitimate target? And I, this, in the context of self-defense, another issue that must be looked into is how do you define legitimate target and, and when is the target legitimate? There are two different questions here. 
One, how do you define legitimate target? And two, when is legitimate target a legitimate target? Not, this, not, not one question, two questions. So I was told by this um, individual that you can kill, the, you can kill the, the terrorist after he's done the suicide bomb. My response was, you know, it's really tough to kill him after the suicide bombing because the dude's dead. And the response I got was that, that from her, her perspective, that is a correct application of self-defense because the state really doesn't have the right to engage in self-defense. So that's one extreme. You need to be sensitive to that. The other extreme, was equally out there, says that at the moment we know that someone poses a threat, however we define threat, he's a legitimate target. And I suggest the following. Precisely because I have had a seat at the table of operational counterterrorism, and I well understand the significance of state power. I am extremely sensitive to the misuse of state power. I suggest we take a narrow view of threat, narrowly defining it, and narrowly defining legitimate target, and narrowly defining when he's a legitimate target. Because if you engage in an expansive view, then what you're really going to end up doing is implementing target killing when it may not be actually operationally necessary. How do we draw this line and how do we draw the continuum? It depends on the following circumstances and the, and the following um, paradigms, if you will. One, you have to ask yourself, how significant is the threat posed by the individual? By example, if we receive an intelligence report that some fellas out there planning on you know, throwing Molotov cocktails, so I don't know how many of you have ever had Molotov cocktails thrown at you. Take my word for it. It's not a particularly pleasant experience. But it's certainly not reason to engage in a, in a targeted killing with respect to somebody who's regularly throwing Molotov cocktails. So that's one question. How about if it's somebody who's planning on a major, sui a major suicide bombing, and this then opens up the following important paradigm. This really is, in many ways, the heart and soul of the entire targeted killing paradigm. I don't know how many of you have been involved in suicide. I mean, I hope none of you have been involved in a suicide bombing, but how many of you? have been, have, you know, thought about it, studied it. Here's what you, if you haven't, here's what you need to know. There are four distinct actors responsible for making a suicide bombing happen. Actor number one is the guy who blows himself up. You know, the foot soldier. Actor number two is the person responsible for logistics, you know, making the bomb, driving the bomber. Actor number three is the quarterback of the football team, you know, Tom Brady. Not a good example. Okay. And, and example, and, and uh, person number four is the financier. There is no terrorism without the financier, just like there is no counterterrorism with in without intelligence information. Four distinct actors r r are required for the suicide bombing app, um, <coughs> paradigm. So now let's ask ourselves, of these four, when are they legitimate targets? I would suggest the following. This guy is a legitimate target for a targeted killing the moment he's about to go conduct it. When he woke up in the morning, is he a legitimate target? No. But as he's getting increasingly close to the site, yes. How about the logistics guy? I would say the logistics guy, who is incredibly important, is a legitimate target far before they're actually driving. See, a legitimate target 24-7, no, but he's much more so than zero, I mean, at the point of attack, and 24-7. The quarterback. The quarterback is a legitimate target 24-7 no, no matter what he's doing. Because the quarterback is the quarterback is the quarterback. Now obviously you have to minimize collateral damage. You have to look at the alternatives. But he is from my perspective a legitimate target 24-7. And the fourth person is the financier. So I put this out there I, when I speak with you know, other law schools to other law students. I put this out there to all you law students. This is a terrific law review note to write. When is a financier a legitimate target? with the understanding that to be engaged in the act of wiring money takes half a second, just do enter. So he's obviously a legitimate target, at least from my perspective, far beyond that half a second it takes to do enter. Is he 24 seven like the quarterback? And I, I stand before you and I say, I don't know the answer, but I do suggest it's something we need to really ask ourselves, what is the proper role in terms of operational counterterrorism 
of minimizing the impact import of the financier. I think it's frankly a subject that um, has not received the attention it must, it should receive, because these guys are extraordinarily important to t in terrorism and are also unbelievably smart and sophisticated, frankly, in many ways, more than we are. So now we have these four actors. All right, so meat to the bones. 10 years ago, plus minus, there was a targeted killing in Gaza. I don't know how many of you have ever been to Gaza. Yes, no, maybe, okay. His name is Shada. Well, his name was Shada. Um, and Shada was, going, was the quarterback of the team that was going to blow up our version of the World Trade Center. I don't know how many of you have ever been to, Tel Aviv, to Israel, but when you fly into Tel Aviv, that we have three buildings that are our version of the World Trade Center. And he was going to blow this damn thing up. And it would have killed, you know, obviously thousands upon thousands of people, uh, Jews and Arabs alike. It was determined that the only way to prevent him from going forward was to kill him. So I think that meets the, the, the test, my test of the quarterback and my test of target killing, legitimacy and so on, with one small problem. When he was killed, he was sound asleep in his house and the quality of the building in Gaza is not exactly like it is in Durham and so the house imploded. And when the house imploded, I don't remember the exact numbers, but 15 of his, of his uh, he has I think either two or three wives and I think he had 10 children. So the collateral damage included his wives and his children. There was enormous criticism and justly so. Because I think in retrospect, decision makers should have done a much more thorough job of looking for alternatives. Yes, he was a legitimate target, but not under those circumstances. So always ask yourselves, yes, the individual poses a threat, if indeed he does. Yes, targeted killing is legitimate from my perspective. Yes, it meets tests of self-defense. Yes, from my perspective, it meets tests of morality, provided, here are the caveats. One, that you have a narrow definition of self-defense. Two, that you have a well-articulated, well-defined, and well-developed checklist. And three, that you are constantly, but constantly engaging in the following difficult questions. How do you define effectiveness? And how do you determine that the policy is indeed minimizing terrorism, both short-term and long-term? Those three caveats, I suggest, are absolutely essential to the conversation. Do all governments implement them all the time? Probably not. Are they absolutely essential and necessary? The answer is yes. A couple of final thoughts. As was announced today um, by, the, by the Obama administration, today, tomorrow, this week, they're going to release the justification for the target killing of, I can't remember what's his name, al You know, that's the American citizen who was the cleric in Yemen raises a number of important questions and issues that I want to put out there. One is the whole transparency discussion. I remind all of us when he was killed, it was all cloaked and you know, that he posed a great threat and so on, so on, so on. So those of us who have stood in front of cameras for you know, innumerable number of occasions articulating policy, it's easy to use that phrase. I, as a believer in transparency, as an advocate of transparency, I think the Obama administration could have done this a while ago. There's no need to wait for all this noise because I think the best defense is a good offense, and if there was justification for killing, we gotta explain what was the justification without you know, giving away the sources and all that. I think A, that's absolutely essential. So transparency is important. Two, you always have to ask yourselves, what's the impact in the local community? And the question of what's the impact in the local community um, is oftentimes shunned aside, but it's very interesting to track how local communities respond to targeted killings in their own communities. You need to know that the local community knows who the terrorists are amongst their midst. I mean, they know this. They know this better than we do. And in some cases, you'll see demonstrations against the target killing, and you'll see people with you know, signs and so on. Don't get caught up in that. Because what you see for public cons consumption is not necessarily what goes on behind closed doors. As a matter of fact, within parentheses, I will add that it's interesting. We have been consistently told in the Palestinian-Israeli paradigm that some Palestinians are willing to become collaborators because they know that Palestinian terrorism is bad for the Palestinian entity. And so one of the, the reactions we see, the, the public demonstrations, I put that out there, don't always get caught up in that as really representing what the public thinks. And three, with well, this I stop, 
ask yourselves at all times, how do you most effectively address this intersection between policy, morality, and law? I would suggest that targeted killing is precisely at that confluence. There is no aspect of counterterrorism that is more obviously um, controversial, more complex, and is absolutely at this intersection. And how you resolve this three-headed monster of policy effectiveness, legality, and morality, I think makes a, will make a significant contribution to our more sophisticated understanding of targeted killing. Final thought, you need to know targeted killing ain't going away. This is what I suggest, and Dunlap and, and Scott may well disagree with me. I think this is the, war, the, the warfare of the future. And we need to have a long and frank conversation about A, is this how we want warfare conducted? And if the answer is yes, how do we want it conducted effectively, legally, and morally? With that, I stop. Questions, anxieties, concerns? Questions, comments, feedback? Sir, in the back. Sure. Well, you're, I think you're a law student. Sure about the logistics guy? Yeah. Right. So it's a good catch. So I say the quarterback is 24-7, clear. The, the bomber, when he's approaching. The logistics guy, he's not 24-7, but he's more than here. Where exactly is he in the continuum? He's, this is not helpful to you. I appreciate your question. I don't, I don't have a clear answer. I'm not going to BS you, right? He's closer to the quarterback than, is he, than to this guy. The financier is even closer to the quarterback. Some have suggested that big time financiers are as, pose as much of a threat as the quarterback and arguably are a legitimate target 24 seven. Full stop. Having you know, taken a long look at the literature, I haven't seen a compelling, frankly speaking, right? <clears throat> a compelling answer on the continuum exactly where to place the financier and the logistics guy. The financier, I meant, right, just, you know, as I said a couple of minutes ago, he's low-hanging fruit for a terrific law review note. And perhaps the same is true for the logistics guy because we have a tendency to say, well, he's just a driver, right? He's just a driver. The truth of the matter is, to be the driver is a really important job, right? I mean, the dude can't get to here without it. The maker of the suicide belt, he's an, he's, you know, he's an important guy. Is he the quarterback? No. Is he really important? Yes. Where exactly in the continuum? Not a very helpful answer. More here than here. Where exactly here? But you know, if I were to um, go take my 3 o'clock phone call from the commander, if I were to tweak the facts, if the commander would have said to me, listen, Gior, the guy is going to bring the back to this guy, right? One step removed. I would have entertained the possibility of authorizing. Doesn't mean I would have said yes. By the way, maybe this will help answer your question. Back to my three o'clock in the morning phone call, at the end of the day, I said no here. And the reason I said no is the following. One, I just wasn't convinced, whatever that means, that this was the, exactly the guy who the source had said was the guy, one. Two, something told me, whatever that means, that the commander himself wasn't convinced that this was the guy. And I took my instinct feeding off of his, I can't say body language because I didn't see him, right? It's all, not, it's all verbal but nonverbal simultaneously, which is complicated. And when the, you know, the blue jeans, blue pants, because I didn't know if he had blue jeans, blue pants, because he had the green on. And while I appreciated the possibility of the extraordinary danger, no joke here, of what was in that damn bag, I did not find it compelling enough for me to say yes. So when I said to the commander, you know, then this three-minute conversation, and by now we're fast friends, I will tell you the following because I'm not embarrassed to say it. 
At the end of that three minute conversation, you're gonna have to take my word for it, I was totally drenched in sweat because the awesomeness of the moment is exactly that, right? When I said no to him, the way he said to me in Arabic, uh, yalla, you know, lala tov, um, it was clear to me that he agreed with me. Now, when he called me, he couldn't say to me, hey, Gior, I think the answer needs to be no. He couldn't say that, right? Because he had to lay out fact pattern. The way he, you know, signed off at the end of the conversation suggested to me that I probably was right. Parentheses within parentheses for a series of complicated reasons which are really way too boring to get into, but you'll appreciate this. Next morning, I went to work. And you know, nobody called me in and saying, man, you're the world's biggest idiot, or good for you, or what was your thought process, or why'd you screw up, or hey, how was your night? Nobody asked me anything. Because at the time, for whatever, purely, those of you who've been to Israel will appreciate this, the way, it's just the way we are, right? right? We weren't really very good at the time at, at after action reports, so I have no idea to this day, if I got it right or if I got it wrong. But they didn't fire me, so maybe I got it right. <laughs> Ambassador? Um, I'd like to turn the telescope around and ask you whether there have been any uh, research work that you have done or anybody else in the nexus of <coughs> politics, of, of policy, law, and morality on responses to targeted killing. How legitimate is that? Under what circumstances? Um, take as an example the targeted killing of the ambassador to Saudi Arabia in the United States of America. I mean, most most people would call that an assassination attempt or a murder. But but for the sake of argument, what is the legitimate response, or where is there any discussion of that? I mean, the legitimate response in terms of this, how does the state respond to the criticism, or how does the other side respond to the targeted killing? How does the other side respond to the targeted killing? It's a really interesting question. Um, and as I said a few minutes ago, you need to be able to ignore the noise of the public demonstrations. So let's look at, for instance, the recent untimely demise of our very good friend Osama bin Laden. So there were three and a half demonstrations. Set two. I find that to be telling. Because there were some demonstrations. I don't think the kind of demonstrations, if I would have told you five years ago we're going to kill bin Laden, that the demonstrations would have been as, um, as noiseless as they were. That, I think, is in telling. Um, two, um, I remind all of us that a couple of years ago there was a senior member of Hezbollah um, who didn't make it through the day alive. And there was predictions that there would be huge demonstrations in Lebanon. Nothing. Which signals to me, again, what I call the terrorist internal community. You need to view the terrorist internal community from a number of different internal communities. One, there's this immediate circle. Immediate, immediate. But here's something you need to know. Here's a little secret. Cannot do a targeted killing without penetrating the terrorist internal community. His inner circle has been penetrated. Nothing scares terrorist cells, like the understanding that you are onto somebody, that somebody within that inner circle is a traitor. So the first thing terrorist cells do after a targeted killing is they, you know, they go off into, you know, into hiding because they're quickly trying to figure out who, what, why, where, when. I mean, there's extraordinary uncertainty. It is a source of extraordinary disquiet for them. So they, this, you know, they understand they've been penetrated. That's one. Two, the, the concentric circle, the second, cat the second internal community. We don't do public opinion polls. You know, Gallup and Pew don't really um, aren't invited to some of these places to do public opinion polls. I think if you were to do Gallup and Pew, you would be surprised. My instinct tells me that the support that we assume that the internal community gives them is not what we assume it to be. And that's why I think more often than not, targeted killings, especially of high profile people, goes unresponded to. And that's why, again, I say one has to ignore the noise and see what's the long term reaction, and you'll see some kind of a disconnect there. Scott? Let me take you to Al Wadi. Your analysis is quite detailed, because you know from Harold Coe's talk, from John Brennan's talk, the United States.
United States position, and we'll probably find out more when this 50-page classified memo is released, seems to be that assuming a, a state of armed conflict with Al-Qaeda and using classic international humanitarian law and not international humanitarian rights law, that a combatant, whether they are on the verge of, of an action or not, is nonetheless targetable. Right. So I guess what I want to ask you is, would your analysis then render the Awaki killing not legal, or are you borrowing some principles from human rights law for your matrix? I, I seem to be hearing you say that. Right. I think that's a great point, Scott. One, because I've been around the block on these things, right? The first thing that always intrigues me, or the first things that intrigue me, are what was the intelligence picture at the time. I can't emphasize that strongly enough. Because I'm a firm believer that you cannot conduct a target killing that is revenge-based or retaliation-based. And so if there was intelligence information that suggests however we define reliability, viability, credibility, and so on of the source, that he was engaged in future activity, that would meet my test, provided to collateral damage and the alternatives. But if there's no intelligence information, or if there was no intelligence information, then I'd be extremely uncomfortable with it, because then it falls into the category of revenge retaliation. And by example, to your question, Scott, I take you all back to the 1972 Munich Olympics, right? I assume everybody knows right, the Munich Olympics. In the aftermath of the Munich Olympics, then Israeli Prime Minister Golda Meir gives an, an order called Operation Wrath of God to kill all Palestinians from the Black September who were involved in, in, the, in the attack on the Israeli athletes. Until five years ago, we all assumed that it was absolutely solely based on revenge and retaliation until there was an interview in Israel's leading newspaper, the Haaretz, in which the then head of the Mossad, our version of the CIA, said that with respect to some of the individuals who were killed, there was intelligence information indicating future activity. That has been largely discounted. And if indeed there was no intelligence information, while I understand the revenge, motiv revenge motivation, I get that, absolute violation of international law. I don't think there's any doubt about that. So with respect to, to uh, al Qawi, if there was intelligence information, Scott, then you can create a paradigm. Um, and you're right, it is a little bit of mixing and matching because I, I don't think, we've also discussed this, right? I don't think that international law, as it's presently construed, really provides clear, concise answers to this, this, this odd paradigm of it's not criminal, it's not um, war, it's whatever the hell this middle thing is. Um, not to get on a, on a, you know, a um, like Hyde Park on a podium and to say international law needs to be re-articulated to address this, whatever this hybrid is, but international law needs to be re-articulated to address whatever this hybrid is, particularly exactly to your question, Scott. How do you defend target killing because what we're all doing at the moment is trying, struggling, trying to mishmash. Also goes obviously to your question, the whole community response. How did you work all that in? <clears throat> I think that that too is low hanging fruit for um, law students. What really should be the, how really should international law be defined 2012 moving forward? I think we're all stuck in the state state paradigm and have done an insufficient job of asking ourselves in the, in the context of the state non state paradigm. Add, add the following though. Here's where it gets a little bit complicated. It's state, non-state, but the non-state actor happens to be residing in a state. And there's a whole sovereignty question here, which we've all conveniently you know, shoved aside. I remind all of us, when bin Laden was visited by the, by the Navy SEALs, God love them, they came to Pakistan. Did we violate Pakistani sovereignty? You betcha. When we did the target killing in Yemen, did we violate um, Yemeni, Yemenite, Yemeni sovereignty? The answer is yes. When we do target killings, God knows where else we're doing target We're violating somebody's sovereignty. So it's not only state, non-state, but it's state, non-state, state, or state impacted. And that's a part of the discussion, to your question, Scott, that somehow has gotten lost in the shuffle, which I think must be addressed. In the back? I wanted to jump off that point exactly. But don't jump. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, but the, uh, the extraterritorial nature of, of this new war, and you know, the US administration is very enthusiastic about it currently, but how does that calculus change when India gets these capabilities, when the Russians get these capabilities? In August of 2004, there was a really nasty terrorist attack in Jerusalem, in Machana Yuda. Um, and the following day, the IDF, the Israeli Air Force, flew into Syria, over Syria, and bombed the terrorist 
um, organizations camp, you know, operate, you know, where they were training. So we absolutely, absolutely violated Syrian sovereignty. When this came up to me before the UN, the Israeli response was the following. We did not violate Syrian sovereignty because we were not attacking Syrian targets. We were attacking a terrorist base that happened to be based on Syrian soil. So we were, when we flew into Syria, we weren't really flying into Syria. We were simply flying over the terrorist base. So old people like me, because I'm old, I thought that was in, uh, disingenuous, if not, you know, disingenuous is a phrase for BS, right? OK. That makes, it's just wrong. Hang on. Now, you can make a viable argument. Self-defense, right? But what's the extent of self-defense? It goes back to what I said to you earlier, going to, to Scott's question. How do we re-articulate international law to take into account, for instance, this whole extra-territorial, extra-territorial, extra-territoriality of this entire conversation? And you're absolutely right. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. And what you do today can come back tomorrow and you know, invite you in a particular part of your anatomy. And we have failed, and this also failed to address this sovereignty question, because we're, well, here's what we're saying, I think. The US says, well, Pakistan, as I understand it, is a US ally. And so they're part of our team against terrorism. Though we all know that's not you know, necessarily correct. Were the Pakistanis given a heads up as to the SEALs were about to come visit? I think the answer probably is not. Do we call the, Yem the Yemenis, the Yemenites? before we you know, do the attack? I assume probably not because you're, you don't, tr I, sorry to say this, we don't trust those governments. And you're scared to death that if you make the phone call, you know, you're going to endanger your own soldiers. And those of you who've been in command positions, yes. The, your primary obligation as a commander is to ensure that your soldiers come home safe and sound. Nothing else really is important, frankly speaking. So there's a real bind here with respect to extraterritoriality. And I agree with you that it raises you know, really powerful questions because what's good here can come back. And it's an issue that I think has been, um, I want to choose my words carefully, I don't think has been satisfactorily addressed. Sir. So, Amos, you did a very interesting job of kind of from the bottom up, right, going through the kinds of questions you would ask, mm -hmm. the, the sorts of criteria, and so forth. I, I want to maybe take a rip off of uh, Scott's question, because a lot of the debate within, both within the United States and outside of the United States, is not at that, there is some at the micro level about collateral damage and so forth, but a lot of the debate is a, a paradigm question, which Scott alluded to, right? Correct. So if you start with the paradigm question, rather than working from the sort of the detailed back, the, the paradigm you choose, whether it's human rights, international human rights law, international humanitarian law, international armed conflict, non-international law, so tons of law review articles, this, you know, have been written about which paradigm is correct, and you can't mix and match. And so I think one of the- Well, you can or you can't. Cannot, right. I mean, that, that's the, there, there are people who argue those. Of right. course. The point is that the paradigm question be, looms really large. Oh, correct. And I just would invite you, because to, to a certain extent, I understand you as saying that you want to try to construct a, a new paradigm. Correct. Right. And, one response, and not necessarily endorsing this, but you could imagine a response from those that support the paradigms, which would be, in effect, your new way has just too high a risk of error, right? We've seen problems in terms of state-to-state -state, uh, <coughs> use of armed force, Iraq, US and Iraq. Um, we, you have problems that you've described at the micro level. Uh, pick up, why not stick to a paradigm that exists that constrains, you don't have to have your, you know, that constrains in bigger terms, right? So what a non-international armed conflict is says certain things about where these sorts of um, targeted killings can be used, if ever. Um, and that that's a better way to go. It's also the law that we have now, albeit it's a categorical choice. So how would you address that response <coughs> to someone who says, you don't have the freedom to design your own legal. I can't be king for the day. <laughs> <coughs> I think it's a great question. It's obviously one, obviously, that I struggle with. As I mentioned to Charlie, I'm actually writing a book on this this very moment on, on target killings. Practically, an overall picture. Okay. Whichever paradigm you want, A, B, C, D. My sense both as somebody who's been involved in it and somebody who's thought long and hard about it, is that their existing paradigms fail to compellingly answer these very specific questions 
of self-defense, legitimate target, when are you a legitimate target, and then this entire discussion about alternatives and collateral damage. It was brought home to me stunningly, and I don't want to exaggerate, in the Obama's under articulation of no collateral damage in American drone policy. That's just wrong. I mean, it, it's just wrong. So that tells me that whatever paradigm they're applying is, if that's how you define collateral damage, guilt by association in the milieu of the terrorist, in their words, Having been there, that tells me that the international law paradigm that they're applying is, is just a fallacy. Okay. That's one. Two, having spent 20 years of my adult life engaged in you know, operational counterterrorism in Israel, clear that we get some things right and clear that we get some things wrong. We call it in Israel, it's a made-up term, and it sounds almost ludicrous, but here it is. It's called in English, armed conflict short of war. That's a term that, that was suggested to the Israeli Supreme Court and one that the Israeli Supreme Court uh, um, adopted. Ask me exactly what that means. You know, I can articulate it, but I don't know exactly what that means. In the context of international humanitarian law, international law, the problem, and I agree with you with the mish and mash that I propose, is that it's a fluid paradigm. I accept that. On the other hand, I don't think the other paradigms effectively and consistently apply definitions. And because I've been around the block, I'm all about definitions because I know what happens when there aren't clear definitions. So believe me, I'm, I'm sensitive to the criticism of the creating a new paradigm. On the other hand, I don't see a consistent application of any of these existing paradigms. Because I don't have to tell you, those of us who've been there know this, policymakers hate paradigms. Policymakers hate definitions because you prefer the wiggle room. But commanders, at the end of the day, commanders absolutely must have narrow definitions. And these existing paradigms, as presently applied, aren't providing that to them. Let me press this, this point a little bit because uh, I do think you have brilliantly drawn upon your own experience, but Israeli law also plays into how Israelis conduct their target killing, and driven by their Supreme, the Supreme, Supreme Court, Court right. example. But uh, allow me to take a little bit different point and take Larry's point. I think that uh, there is a, a paradigm. It does work and has worked. And it is a different perspective because in the real world, it's hard to get the level of detailed intelligence information that, that you would require. Yet we have this whole other set of law, international humanitarian law, the law of armed conflict, where you determine if the person is in the status of being you know, a belligerent, then it doesn't matter what they're doing at that particular time. And so the idea, the normative perspective, do you want to give someone more rights, so to speak, than someone in the armed forces? Because if someone is in the armed forces, and they're a, they're a cook, and they're asleep in their bed, completely unarmed, it's perfectly legal to come up and cut their throat and kill them. Whereas, do we want to have a parody where you benefit by not following international law and being part of an organized armed force and so forth and wearing a uniform. And oh, by the way, if you metastasize outside the area of, of conflict, then you get further benefits. I mean, where does the normative, normative arguments play into the theory? I mean, these are two great questions, right? Um, I think what's I think what we were disagreeing with disagreed before on this, right? Um, those who you know Don and I have disagreed about this before, right? Um, is what's the proper norm? We've been to this road here. <laughs> in case you can't tell. <laughs> what's the proper normative um, structure for target killing? Your own policy. What's the definition definition of a belligerent? I mean, that goes the young man who's, who had to leave. What's the who's the belligerent here? Do you have a broad definition of belligerent or a narrow definition of belligerent? Um, if you take a broad swath, then 
lots of people who are legitimate targets should, will be defined as legitimate targets even though they shouldn't be defined as legitimate targets. Which is why I, in terms of the normative uh, paradigm, I am an advocate of, of creating narrow definitions. That's why I think that self-defense has to be narrowly defined and narrowly applied. You're right, Charlie, that we in Israel get great guidance from the Israeli Supreme Court, which laid out A, B, C, D, under what conditions can you do this? It'll be interesting to see whether this much anticipated, hang on just a second, this much anticipated memo addresses these issues concisely, or whether this much anticipated memo does, you know, we all know how to write government memos, right? They do these broad strokes. What's your guess? Give us, give us support. As broad as, broad, as, as broad as my hair is short. <laughs> I think they're going to go both ways. <laughs> I Sir. I want to ask, I don't know, if you might have mentioned this before, but does the magnitude of the planned attack that you're getting from intelligence play in, and, and how so? I mean, because yes. ultimately it's an exchange. I mean, morality comes out with trading attempt to live here at the Lindesand person. Yeah, and it, it, the potential, what a potential means, right? The, right. The, the potential threat posed by the individual plays a role. That's why I gave you the example of the Molotov cocktail. I mean, that doesn't justify it. But for instance, this, the, the, third clock, the example I gave you, the potential harm posed to Israeli national security by this guy was for real. Um, but it wasn't enough. <clears throat> I appreciated the potential harm. I mean, I, you know, I have a dog in the fight. I have to live there, right? But I wasn't convinced that this guy was this guy. But weighing heavily in my mind, was if the information was correct and this was the guy, that the two together absolutely posed a threat to security. So the, the potential enormity of it, consequences, plays a role. Yes. I think we have time for one more question. I have a two, actually a two-part question. Um, <laughs> the first part of the question is, what are the range of permissible instrumentalities used in targeted killing? And the second part is, does that intersection between legality, policy, and morality influence the kind of instrumentality? Yes, absolutely. That's a great question. That's a great question. Uh, the, the, the instrumentality has to be meet a two-part test of, yes, seeking to they will kill him while minimizing collateral damage. You can't engage in, I don't like the term, I apologize, overkill. And that, that overkill absolutely ties into this, um, this intersection. So it has to be sufficient to kill him, but not powerful enough to cause additional harm, which also requires the decision makers to be extremely sensitive to what instrumentality you have available to it. And go back to the question I asked the commander, was his unit sufficiently trained in, in, the, in the requisite instrumentality? Because if they're not, then you're gonna have overkill. <coughs> All right. Unfortunately, other people need to use this, this class term. Amos, this was absolutely terrific. You fulfilled by every expectation. <laughs> lots to think about and, and a whole different perspective that I think a lot of us haven't had a chance to consider. Thank you very much. Let's give him a call. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.